Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Dawson, the Vice President of Compliance Solutions. I have over 30 years of pharmaceutical and biotech experience with 15 years of that experience as a compliance officer. Welcome to Core Data's first in a three-part webinar series designed to take what appears to be a complex world of compliance monitoring and simplifying it. All companies are required to do some level of monitoring from large companies to small, those with the CIA and those that don't. The level of monitoring and the complexity of the monitoring varies depending on each company's situation. The key is to monitor the right things the right way for the right reasons, making it as simple as possible while maintaining effectiveness. I found as a compliance officer, some of the most difficult questions I had to answer were, how do you know the compliance program is working? Is it going to prevent a government investigation? Are you correctly identifying high risk activities and in individuals and how do you know? Have you taken the appropriate corrective actions and are they working? How are you measuring your compliance program success? Do you have any benchmarks? Without an effective compliance program and data analytics, you cannot answer these questions with confidence. We tried the best we can with the resources we have available, but we, we are still limited. Therefore, we need to constantly rethink and improve our approach to monitoring. Today, we begin the process to help you rethink your monitoring approach and, <clears throat> and help you develop an effective and efficient monitoring program. Let's take the complex and make it simple. Today's webinar is designed to look at compliance monitoring from a more government and legal perspective to provide you an overview of what an effective compliance program looks like from a government perspective, focusing on monitoring, a look at what the deficiencies in company monitoring programs are, and recommendations for companies wanting to enhance their monitoring programs. To assist us with this, we are fortunate to have Bill Sorrell with us, who Bill is senior member of healthcare uh, practice group and nationally recognized healthcare, lawyer, uh, uh, recognized healthcare lawyer with Sidley Austin. He also serves as global coordinator for healthcare in the privacy, data security, and information law practice. Mr. Sorrell concentrates on a, a variety of healthcare matters, including Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, coverage and coding, pharmaceutical price reporting, issues related to marketing and promotion of pharmaceuticals and medical devices, internal investigations, clinical research issues, stark and anti-kickback law analysis, Medicare and Medicaid audits, healthcare acquisitions, and more. Bill has defended clients in some of the largest healthcare fraud investigations brought by the U.S. government. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School. More importantly, in my opinion, Bill has been recognized as an intellectual heavyweight, a very good communicator and trusted advisor for superbly handling all the regulatory issues encountered by his clients as well as being hugely professional on every issue. Having worked with Bill in the past, all the praise is truly deserved. And it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Bill, who will share his insights on how to the government looks at uh, compliance programs, monitoring, and how to help you build a better one for the future. Bill, it, I'm proud to have you here, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Well, thanks, Jim. You're very kind. I'm sure I will not live up to that introduction, but uh, those are very kind words, and I appreciate your, uh, your introducing me. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to work with you. You're a fantastically knowledgeable and skilled compliance professional, and uh, I think the design of your three-part program reflects uh, your expertise and your uh, really intimate knowledge of these very difficult and very important issues. So I'm delighted to be here today. Um, as a lawyer, I have to begin, of course, with disclaimers. Uh, my first disclaimer is that the views that I will be expressing are my personal views. They're not the views of my law firm or anyone else. Uh, second, although I'm a lawyer and I'm certainly going to try to share some perspective today, 
uh, our communication today is not attorney-client privilege. We don't have uh, an attorney-client relationship. My comments do not involve uh, or include an endorsement. And uh, finally, I'm going to repeat many things that the government says. My repeating those positions of the government is not an endorsement of those positions. Uh, you probably will uh, see that I am uh, often in disagreement with the government, but today we're going to try to understand in a serious and significant way the perspective that the government has because that perspective informs what can be valuable in uh, data analytics. So with that introduction, let's jump in um, and go to the next slide. Uh, this is old news, I'm sure, to everyone. Uh, the government's involvement uh, with healthcare could not be more extensive. And unfortunately, despite the fact that its involvement uh, with healthcare is so extensive, often the standards that it has set uh, are ambiguous. And that combination of very extensive uh, involvement by the government and often ambiguous guidance from the government necessarily is a breeding ground for enforcement. And that uh, breeding ground for enforcement uh, visits itself in many different areas, some of which and only some of which are listed in this slide. So we have obviously exposure uh, potentially in many different ways. And therefore, uh, data analytics, in terms of its ability potentially to identify and help mitigate issues, uh, needs to, at least at a high level, contemplate these various risks, which ones are, in fact, more of a priority, and how data analytics can or can't be particularly helpful in trying to mitigate those risks. Beyond, uh, if we go to the next slide, beyond the, uh, the range of uh, substantive areas that the government has uh, a focus and a uh, level of involvement. There is, of course, a, uh, a range of actors. Again, the ones listed here are only some of the relevant governmental actors, but they include, of course, the most important ones, which include the uh, Department of Justice, uh, the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Health and Human Services, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, and uh, increasingly uh, the state uh, governments, particularly states' attorneys general, are very important voices in identifying and uh, realizing risk for life sciences companies. Uh, the next slide uh, also is probably old hat to many of you, but always uh, useful to sort of ground ourselves in just how substantial and really disproportionate the focus is by the federal and state government on uh, healthcare enforcement. Uh, the number of False Claims Act cases filed in fiscal year 2021 the most recent data that we have from the federal government in its annual report uh, was a uh, quite uh, astonishing uh, almost 600 cases filed in that fiscal year. The total recoveries, the second uh, largest year for recoveries uh, since uh, the federal government began developing those numbers uh, was in fact last year at 5.6 billion. This, uh, the uh, second uh, uh, highest year, uh, with the highest year being fiscal year of 2014. Uh, perhaps in, in uh, many respects, the most interesting number that comes out of the annual report from a healthcare perspective is the percentage of uh, healthcare recoveries that are actually uh, related to the use of the government's broad tools specifically with respect to healthcare targets. And that's a remarkably high 90%. So if you think back to False Claims Act enforcement uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would have seen a much lower percentage where uh, particularly defense uh, contractors had been a, uh, another uh, quite large, quite significant focus for uh, False Claims Act enforcement by the federal government. Healthcare enforcement has really usurped 
uh, every other industry sector from the government's uh, enforcement perspective. And unfortunately, as large as uh, $5.6 billion in recoveries is in a single year, uh, the government's estimate of fraud and error uh, in healthcare is a much larger $68 billion. So the government believes at uh, some significant level that it really has only scratched the surface of what it could pursue and what it would want to pursue. If we go to uh, the next slide, uh, the government itself uh, is happy to tell everyone uh, early and often uh, just how important uh, its focus is on healthcare enforcement issues. I have a quote from uh, 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 the Deputy Attorney General, Associate Attorney General. Uh, which uh, was uh, a product of a, uh, of a speech to industry uh, in which uh, you see the same messaging over and over again. Enforcing the False Claims Act is a top priority for the department, not just for our office. Uh, this, in 2019, already was the ninth consecutive year that the department's civil health care fraud settlements and judgments exceeded $2 billion. So that's a string of more than a decade of uh, quite intensive and from the government's perspective, amazingly productive focus on healthcare enforcement. Uh, on the OIG side today, the False Claims Act remains among the most powerful tools in the government's fraud fighting arsenal. And then the specific reference there to healthcare showing again, uh, the government's focus on uh, that sector and not insubstantially uh, the life sciences subcomponent of that uh, sector. If we go to the next slide, uh, it's uh, obviously uh, the case that uh, the review of data and the performance of data analytics is embedded in the structure of the way the government thinks about compliance and compliance programs. Uh, one way that we can see that is in the foundational piece of the government's thinking about compliance programs, which of course is the U.S. Sentencing uh, Commission guidelines that spell out uh, what an effective compliance program is for purposes of being considered in the sentencing of a defendant. And uh, we have the seven, uh, I'm sure, quite familiar uh, elements of an effective compliance program presented here, and a number of them, either implicitly or explicitly, have a very strong emphasis on data and data analytics issues. In particular, we might look at element five and seven. Five, that reasonable steps to achieve compliance, which uh, must include systems for monitoring, auditing, and reporting and seven, that there needs to be reasonable steps to respond to and prevent further similar offenses upon detection of a violation. So uh, although the words data and data analytics, at least in the Sentencing Commission guidelines and those uh, seven uh, components don't explicitly uh, appear, it really, just as Jim was saying earlier, it's impossible for you to address these criteria without in fact having a data analytic component to your compliance program. Uh, next uh, slide talks then about the OIG's gloss, if you will, on the Sentencing Commission uh, structure uh, here in the context of the OIG's elements for what it believes to be effective compliance programs. These elements in turn are reflected in each of the industry guidances that uh, OIG has issued, including those that target and attempt to inform uh, drug and device companies in the life sciences sectors. And uh, overarching is obviously the OIG's expectation that companies will make a good faith effort to comply with all applicable laws and requirements and uh, their belief that an effective compliance program is the uh, single most important and primary mechanism by which that can be, uh, that can be demonstrated. 
uh, for the OIG, an effective compliance program uh, can and should significantly reduce the risk of unlawful conduct and therefore any penalties that may flow from that conduct. And just as the Sentencing uh, Commission has seven elements that it focuses on, OIG has its own uh, seven elements. And uh, here again in uh, elements five and seven uh, in particular, you see uh, uh, expectations for internal auditing and monitoring and responding appropriately to issues as they occur, which again implicitly require a data analytic uh, perspective and, and uh, infrastructure in, a, uh, in an effective compliance program. Uh, if we go next to uh, the way that DOJ says that it will evaluate uh, the effectiveness of corporate compliance programs, both in deciding whether to pursue a particular enforcement matter or uh, how it might resolve uh, a matter that DOJ has in fact decided to pursue, how uh, significantly um, it may impose uh, fines and penalties as a part of those uh, resolutions. DOJ uh, makes really even more explicit uh, the importance of data analytics. So uh, here, uh, DOJ, Jim started with some excellent uh, questions that compliance officers should be asking themselves. Indeed, those questions are substantially a reflection of what DOJ says that it should be asking itself in evaluating uh, company uh, compliance programs. The three fundamental questions that DOJ sets out for itself is, uh, is the uh, corporation's compliance program well designed first. Second, is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? And the sub questions underneath that that inform that uh, more overarching question are, uh, is the uh, program adequately resourced and is it empowered to function effectively? Finally, third, does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? And again, data analytics is a necessary component of being able to effectively answer those three questions. If we move on, uh, we have in uh, DOJ's additional guidance here, uh, now really truly explicit references to the importance of data and data analytics. So in spelling out how DOJ should answer for itself those three overarching questions, it asks uh, these sub questions that point directly to the importance of data and data analytics. First, whether uh, compliance personnel have sufficient access to relevant sources of data to allow for effective monitoring and testing and then importantly, it focuses on three areas here, policies, controls, and transactions. Uh, in addition, uh, a couple of uh, sub bullets down, DOJ uh, asks the important question whether the company undertakes periodic risk assessments that are limited to a snapshot in time or based on continuous access to operational data and information across functions. So obviously what that reflects is a view that uh, in uh, DOJ, DOJ's mind at least, that uh, these sort of data analytic exercises and wider compliance uh, monitoring activities shouldn't be limited in a single snapshot, but they should look at the uh, progression or uh, appropriate control of issues over time. What I would say is, and I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in uh, slides that uh, occur later in the presentation, we can take what DOJ says here a little too literally. Uh, one of the pitfalls, unfortunately, in uh, trying to incorporate in a meaningful way data analytic components to a compliance program is that uh, some companies can focus on the same issues over and over and over and over again. And although some repetition of looks is quite helpful in demonstrating that uh, issues 
uh, have been adequately addressed uh, or that uh, what might appear as effective systems in the first instance aren't becoming less effective over time, there is a point where looking at the same issue over and over again just isn't a smart investment of limited time and resources from a compliance perspective. So we have to take uh, DOJ's words here with a little grain of salt. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future uh, slides as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, OIG, uh, uh, in, in talking uh, about uh, the critical importance of data and data analytics, drives the same themes home again and again. Uh, how does the company collect, track, and analyze and use information uh, for uh, from its compliance reporting mechanisms. And in the last sub bullet there, when auditing its compliance program, what testing of controls, collection and analysis of compliance data uh, and other activities does the company undertake? So you see, uh, again, uh, the governmental perspective of the critical importance of data analytics. We don't have to guess at that, the government tells us that over and over again. Uh, finally, uh, if we uh, take a step away in the next slide from the question of, uh, important question of how the government might analyze a uh, corporate entity for purposes of whether or not it believes that that corporate entity has or doesn't have an effective compliance program, there's another really important perspective that tells us uh, how uh, important data analytics really are. And that is uh, the perspective that comes not in terms of how the uh, government might use its prosecutorial discretion in any particular instance, but how the government actually uh, uses, how it wields its uh, government enforcement powers. And we see really increasingly the primary role of data analytics as exercised by the government in driving enforcement matters and from multiple different levels. Uh, for, uh, for the government, uh, data analytics is a mechanism to select issues to focus on in the first instance. Uh, it's also a mechanism to select specific targets from the vast array of targets that might exist with respect to a particular issue. And then finally, it's a very powerful tool. It's a primary tool for the government to actually, at least in its view, prove its allegations against a selected target for a selected issue. You don't have to uh, guess at this uh, either. You can look at any one of a number of OIG reports and you see OIG using data analytics to do these three things. First, to select issues that should be a focus for it, for DOJ, for others uh, in the enforcement uh, environment. Second, to select uh, particular companies that should be a focus of those uh, enforcement efforts. And finally, suggesting the lines of attack that will be used in order to quote unquote prove the allegations that will be advanced. One recent example of this, and it's just an example, there are literally dozens and dozens of OIG reports that prove the same point, is uh, an OIG report that looks at uh, what it believes to be problematic uh, utilization of uh, medical devices, kits, and lab tests in the genomic testing uh, environment. Uh, and uh, uh, OIG uh, first makes uh, a, a data-driven case uh, citing the uh, significant increase in genomic testing and the cost to the federal programs for why this should be an issue that it and other law enforcement agencies focus on. Second, it has uh, a very helpful chart that indicates uh, what, the, uh, what its findings are with respect to the 100 uh, companies that produce the most significant proportion of government spending in this area. And you can bet 
that those 100 companies over the course of this year and next year and the year after are going to be uh, the focus of unwanted attention from OIG and others. And finally, uh, by then looking at billing and coding information uh, and uh, Sunshine Act and other information available to the government, uh, you see uh, the uh, folks at OIG set out a series of criticisms uh, of uh, these, uh, these medical device uh, companies and uh, the providers that they interact with. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next uh, slide. And I'd like to take you through a real world example of how uh, data analytics can help. Uh, and can help uh, uh, in terms of uh, really addressing some of these risks. Before I do that though, I do wanna pause and just emphasize again, using the government's own words, uh, what, the, uh, what the importance of data analytics is from the government's perspective. And obviously if this is a mechanism by which the government identifies issues, identifies targets, pursues those targets, then we, in trying to uh, identify and mitigate those risks, need to be trying to uh, replicate, uh, to the extent that we can, with the limited resources we have, what the government is doing on its end. And the government tells us, uh, again, uh, over and over again, uh, what it is doing and how central it is to its thinking and to the agenda that it's setting for itself. I won't belabor uh, each of these uh, quotes. I'll just uh, take uh, one of them from the most recent 2021 fiscal year annual report from both uh, HHS and DOJ. Uh, there, uh, among the many uh, data analytic references that are included in this report, is one that says that health, the healthcare uh, fraud strike force teams, which have been a, a, a recurrent uh, actor in producing and in pressing um, uh, industry-wide uh, investigations and quite successful uses of uh, government enforcement tools. The uh, strike force uh, harnesses data analytics and the combined resources of federal, state, and local enforcement entities to prosecute complex healthcare fraud matters. Uh, they take great pride in their ability to use uh, and deploy data analytics as the driver of their prioritization and their implementation of their uh, planned uh, uh, targeting. So uh, next slide makes uh, the same uh, point. Uh, I'll note the last uh, reference there on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, uh, the annual reports uh, increasingly from year to year talk not just about governmental use of data analytics, but through the Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership, which is both a public and a private exercise, uh, the use of data analytics and the sharing of those data analytics uh, with private parties such as managed care plans, insurance companies, PBMs, and others. Uh, so uh, very important to see how uh, data analytics informs not just what uh, the government does uh, from an enforcement and oversight perspective, but obviously how it uh, shapes the activities of others. So on to uh, the example that I alluded to earlier in the next slide, uh, knowing what the government is doing, knowing uh, the use of data analytics from uh, its governmental prosecutorial perspective, uh, this is an example of how a company in the life sciences sector uh, used data analytics to defend itself, to, to identify issues, to uh, mitigate those issues, and ultimately to defend itself against allegations. So in this particular example, a pharmaceutical company uh, noted a uh, significant shift in its uh, product utilization it did not in the first instance have a particularly good understanding of why that shift in utilization was occurring. Didn't have uh, also a particularly good sense of the extent 
of that shift. It, it understood it to be uh, potentially significant, but it really couldn't in a meaningful way quantify that shift. In this particular case, this company uh, had been sponsoring uh, uh, testing services uh, to help identify appropriate candidates uh, for the uh, treatment intervention. And it was able then to use uh, that data to uh, identify more and less likely on label use of its product. And when it did that, when it performed that data analytic exercise, it in fact found that over time, there was a significant increase in a particular off-label use. All right, so that's the identification of a potential issue, obviously an issue that the government has pursued uh, against multiple companies. So what's the next step? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here, we want to do further analysis that will hopefully inform not just the identification of the issue, but a plan to mitigate the risk that now has been identified. And sub-analysis of the data that was available uh, revealed some important things. First, that a relatively high percentage of the increasing off-label use, or at least what appeared to be likely off-label use, was a function of a relatively small number of prescribers. Second, the prescribers uh, were not particularly well correlated to particular sales territories. That's a very helpful fact uh, in terms of uh, beginning to analyze what the relative risk might be here, because obviously if it is correlated to particular sales territories, and there isn't some other explanation for that, like perhaps a higher uh, uh, frequency of uh, the underlying disease condition uh, in a population uh, that is reflective of that, of that uh, region. Uh, that, uh, that lack of coordination, lack of uh, correlation to a sales territory may de-emphasize the possibility that sales messaging is a relative contributor to the increase in off-label uh, uh, activity, off-label usage of the product. Uh, also very interesting in the sub-analysis was that the prescribers, uh, uh, the higher uh, volume prescribers in what was uh, more likely an off-label use, uh, divided pretty uh, evenly between uh, very sophisticated clinicians in uh, very experienced centers of excellence uh, where one would expect that uh, sales messaging would have you know, not particularly great impact. And then uh, among much less experienced community practitioners, not even community practitioners who uh, were relevant specialists in, in the uh, on-labeled uses of the product, more uh, uh, practitioners of broader specialties or even general practitioners. And there, there might be at least potentially greater risk that sales messaging could have an influence on prescription decisions. So uh, uh, some very important uh, sub-analysis here that helps to further identify the nature of the potential risk, and then potentially also helps us identify what uh, mitigation steps might be prudent. And the company uh, took a number of different steps in response. Uh, it uh, changed incentive compensation and altered call schedules for sales representatives. Um, and then in something that was really quite innovative in, in my experience, it uh, decided uh, that it would have its medical affairs personnel uh, directed only by the medical affairs function offer to speak to these prescribers and to specifically educate them on the limits of the evidence with respect to this uh, potential off-label use. In other words, it was a, a bit of the company counter detailing itself, if you will, from uh, a medical uh, uh, affairs perspective. Uh, and uh, uh, what 
what the company did was it not only offered that education, but then it looked thereafter at what the effect was or wasn't uh, on the prescriber and uh, if it made sense to come back and offer a second education session, it did that as well. Um, next slide uh, gets in now to the issue of not designing a mitigation strategy, but then testing whether that mitigation strategy was effective. Um, uh, if we go back to the previous slide, I'm sorry. Um, and so here, uh, uh, there was a range of responses to the offer of medical affairs education. Some prescribers, uh, not uh, insubstantially those associated with large, very sophisticated academic medical centers, uh, were happy to say, no, we don't need to meet. Uh, we're comfortable making the decisions that we do. Uh, for the particular disease condition at issue. There are very poor, uh, if altogether non-existent, alternative uh, options. We understand what the limitations are in the evidence. Uh, we uh, do what we do after exhausting every other option when this is the only option available and we're comfortable doing so. But uh, for some uh, prescribers, they were willing to meet. Some thereafter changed their practices to some extent. Some did not. Uh, and uh, for those that did not change their practice, I think this is a key point, um, this was still an effective exercise because what it demonstrated was why those prescribers were making the decisions that they were. They were saying the sorts of things that I said to you earlier, which obviously explained the prescription decisions without leading uh, back to problematic sales messaging. Um, uh, now, as it turns out, perhaps the best effectiveness <laughs> uh, measure is whether or not it keeps you out of trouble. And in this particular example, uh, this was exactly the test that was presented because unknown to the company at the time that it was identifying this issue, uh, defining a mitigation strategy and then testing the effectiveness of that mitigation strategy, there was a False Claims Act case under seal that actually was targeting uh, what uh, was alleged to be off-label promotion of the product. And uh, happily, because the company had taken the steps that it had using uh, its data analytics uh, uh, initiatives, the government decided not to intervene in the case. And as a consequence of the government deciding not to intervene in the case, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's law firm decided uh, to drop the matter and to dismiss the case. All right, on to the next slide. What are some of the practical lessons learned about using data analytics and trying to do so in a particularly cost-effective and uh, targeted fashion? Well, uh, I'm actually gonna start with the second point first. Uh, before we get to what we're gonna look at, uh, we should be thinking about the data that we're, we're collecting and retaining and whether we really should be collecting and retaining it. Because if we're not going to ourselves look at that data from a compliance perspective, if we're not going to deploy data analytics, um, there is a question about why we're maintaining it. Because by maintaining it, we may be giving the government and others who may be critical of us an opportunity to look at things we haven't look, uh, looked at and uh, turn that into criticisms and allegations against us. Now, uh, having said that, it's obviously fundamentally important that once we have any reasonable basis to believe that uh, the government or others might be considering litigation against us, uh, against our company, we need to take all appropriate and reasonable steps to ensure that the data that we have that may be relevant to those issues is preserved in a reasonable fashion. So that's a very important caveat to that threshold question. 
All right, well, assuming that we've done that, and we uh, have decided to collect the data and maintain the data that we have, um, we should be thoughtful in what we select for analysis. And there are a bunch of things that go wrong here that uh, lead to low utility out of data analytics exercises if we're not being thoughtful on the front end. Among those are looking at data that just can't tell us very much. We don't have the necessary data elements, for instance, to actually find the answers to the questions that we would like to pose. Second, uh, the issue that we're looking at just isn't a substantial risk area for us. Third, maybe the reason that we're selecting it is it's easy for us to do the analysis, but not partic particularly valuable for us to do the, the exercise. And then finally, um, has this issue, alluding to something I said earlier, been sufficiently reviewed already in the past such that, such that our you know, spending additional time and resources here really isn't providing enough value given the cost in uh, both monetary and, and time uh, commitment. All right, at the bottom of the page here, uh, if again, this is sort of emphasizing a point already made, we have data, but it doesn't have the data elements that we need to answer the questions that we want answered. We're starting from a false premise. We're wasting time. We're spinning our wheels. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, of course, as a lawyer, I have to uh, always uh, focus on this question, which is again among the important threshold questions. Uh, is this a look? Is this a data analytic exercise that we should be doing under attorney client privilege? And uh, there is not a one size fits all answer here. There are multiple factors to be considered. Some of them will uh, potentially point towards uh, undertaking the analysis and having the direction of counsel with respect to that analysis. And there will be uh, many other situations where that doesn't make sense. Among the pro factors for uh, proceeding under privilege uh, would be uh, first, uh, situations where there is obviously a substantial likelihood that a litigation or enforcement issue will result. Second, uh, if there in fact has already been a threat of, uh, of litigation or enforcement activity, then you know, that might be in the no-brainer category. Uh, but by the same token, uh, there are factors that can point the other way. Cost, obviously, can be a consideration here. But beyond that, we need to sort of think about the structure of what we're trying to do, uh, if you will, at a policy level by undertaking these data analytic activities. Are we trying, for instance, to show the independence of the compliance function? If we are, then having it undertaken uh, under privilege may be counter to the policy message that we're trying to develop and document. Similarly, if uh, we've embraced a model where we're making the business itself responsible for compliance, at least at a, at a frontline basis. Uh, obviously, having it undertaken under privilege takes away from that message, that policy perspective, that view of how to make compliance effective and to embed it in the organization. Sometimes these two things can be done in combination. Maybe the first look at a particular issue is done under privilege, but subsequent uh, uh, looks that may reflect initial remediation efforts might not be. So uh, there can be a mix and match uh, mix and match approach that is taken. Next uh, lesson learned: Don't kid yourself about what you're seeing. Under the False Claims Act, of course, one of the ways the government can prove the requisite intent for a False Claims Act violation is that the corporation or the individual is acting with willful blindness. And if we are on our third analysis, uh, we didn't like the conclusions that we're naturally following from the first analysis and then the second cut, and then we're now on our third cut, we might be in the land of willful blindness. Sometimes the natural conclusion is in fact the correct conclusion. Uh, and uh, we can waste at, at some point time and energy and create additional problems for ourselves if we don't 
in fact embrace what appears to be the quite real and substantial conclusions of the work that we've done. Um, next, uh, don't look and then fail to act where you find the problem. Uh, the other uh, way, one of the other ways that the government can prove a False Claims Act violation from an intent perspective is that the corporation or the individual has acted with reckless indifference to an issue. And if you've identified an issue, then you don't proceed to trying to identify mitigation and assessing uh, the effectiveness of that mitigation. The government is going to say that that is proof of reckless indifference with respect to the problem. Uh, don't next look and act, but fail to document that you did the look and that you uh, undertook uh, the remediation effort. People leave corporations uh, with increasing frequency and your ability at a later date and time to demonstrate the effectiveness of what you've done is uh, not infrequently a function of the documentation of what you've done. All right, next slide. Uh, some other observations here that uh, you can think that you fixed something, but experience would tell many of us that if your fix isn't actually reduced to a system, to a policy, to a procedure, to a guidance document, it isn't really a fix. Uh, and so we have to think in those sorts of systematic ways. Uh, checking for effectiveness, as I uh, said earlier, is a very important uh, component to, uh, to all of these data analytic efforts. That doesn't mean you have to look at the same issue five years in a row, but it does mean that if you identified an issue uh, and you have proceeded with a mitigation strategy, you need to, you need to consider uh, how to test the effectiveness of that mitigation strategy. And then finally, I would say that although it is not uh, certainly always the case that a communication to uh, enforcement authorities is uh, necessary or uh, the prudent thing to do in, in a particular circumstance, these sort of data analytic exercises can create, at least sometimes, a really helpful opportunity to have a transparency communication uh, with the government uh, that minimizes uh, to the fullest extent possible uh, the risk that the organization may have. So for instance, in a price reporting context where you've identified issues with respect to data, sending uh, a reasonable assumptions document uh, to CMS to outline uh, for uh, that uh, price reporting exercise, uh, the steps that you've taken and how they have then led to certain reasonable assumptions can be a very effective way of cutting off False Claims Act uh, liability. That is one that I can say uh, has been effective for me in real terms with uh, U.S. Attorney's offices who were very interested in bringing False Claims Act cases, having seen transparency communications and saying, yep, under the Supreme Court's uh, guidance about uh, how a lack of materiality in even a false claim uh, negates False Claims Act liability, you know, given what you've said to the regulatory agency here, we just don't think it's prudent to move forward with a False Claims Act case. All right, that's the end of my uh, prepared slides, and I think uh, we're going to at least uh, try to see if you have any questions uh, that I or, or uh, Jim or both of us could uh, address for you. I did get one question in advance, which was a great question and which I felt uh, rather foolish for not having a slide. So I'm going to ask that question of myself and then answer it. Uh, the question is, uh, Bill, what areas uh, from a data analytic perspective have you found to be fruitful for life sciences companies to, uh, to focus on? Um, so I'm going to start with uh, some disclaimers. Uh, I can't help myself as a lawyer. Uh, and this calls to some extent to some of the good points that Jim made at the beginning. You know, there isn't a one size fits all answer to what you should prioritize. Uh, that is a function of your individual circumstances, uh, what the particular risks are uh, that, you know, uh, are, are most uh, 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 
indicative of the vulnerabilities that your organization has. With that said, I would say that among those areas that I have found and clients have found to be uh, quite productive, first, uh, off-label promotion risks. The, the ability to look at utilization to find or not find correlation to sales territories, individual sales personnel um, is among uh, the many helpful tools in trying to control uh, off-label promotion risks. There are uh, a number of other data analytic uh, perspectives and, and, and approaches that can be taken in that area, but those are some of the examples of things that can be done, that can identify issues and then inform mitigation strategies as reflected in the example that I gave earlier. A second area I would say I would broadly refer to as service fee relationships, whether that's with uh, clinical trial uh, uh, partners, whether that's with specialty pharmacies, whether that's with PBMs that are offering services, uh, whether that's with physician consultants, obviously a, a, a wide variety of different service fee relationships. And, uh, you know, fair market value is clearly a core issue there. It presents itself as an issue that data analytics can help us with in many uh, different respects. I'm only going to mention a few of those. First is whether or not we really have a sufficient basis for uh, the range of fair market value that we've set for ourselves and the quality of the data and the assumptions that uh, was used to create that range. Second, the variability of how the organization has then applied that range of fair market value and what correlation there is or isn't to other factors like, for instance, how in the purchase side, component of the relationship, there is larger or fewer purchases. Third, uh, and I think this is a really important focus, is the question of what the actual performance of those service agreements looks like. You can have a great fair market value, uh, fair market value opinion up front. You can have policies and procedures that look really good and are really good in terms of developing that range and the data and the assumptions that are used to create that range. But if it turns out that, you know, we don't actually perform the contract the way it's set out in the contract, all of that uh, becomes not just uh, a positive for us, it actually becomes a negative for us. It shows the government a roadmap for how to prove that uh, the compensation exceeded fair market value and then as a consequence, potentially uh, involves kind of kickback statute issues. Uh, other areas include other financial relationships, whether that's grant relationships, charitable donations, uh, and related reporting, such as uh, Sunshine Act reporting. And then uh, those first three are sort of equally true on the pharmaceutical side and, and the device side. Give one uh, pharmaceutical uh, side uh, specific. Uh, with uh, the integrity of the data used in federal price reporting and in state uh, transparency reporting. That's a, a very fruitful area in my experience. And then finally, a medical device specific example, or at least more of a, 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 an example that tends to be more relevant to medical device uh, companies, and that is billing and coding analyses, the distribution of uh, higher reimbursed versus lower reimbursed uh, 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 services or configurations of, of medical devices or the uses of those medical devices also uh, can be very important in terms of the medical necessity analysis, which in turn can lead back to our first issue, which is uh, the potential for that data to show us something about the risk of off-label promotion. All right, we've got four more minutes uh, left here. Don't know if there are any questions in the queue. Jim and I are happy to take those. Do we have any questions that have come in? Uh, if not, I have one for you, Bill. In listening to your presentation, and you've really done a nice job of laying out how the government looks at uh, the companies and where the vulnerabilities are. But I think historically, we as compliance officers have always looked at basically past CIAs and we tend to look at what the 
government has put forth as far as monitoring activities and what they're looking for. And it always gets down to speaker programs, ride-alongs, advisory boards, and monitoring for all those activities. And to me, maybe I'm missing it, correct me, it seems like we're dealing with symptoms and not the root cause. And what you're outlining, is, if I'm correct, is let's look for the root cause of the problem, identify that early, and then put in the corrective actions, which may include the monitoring of uh, sales calls or ride-along or speaker programs, et cetera. Is that yeah, I, what you're seeing? I, 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 think, I think that's uh, certainly part of what I'm uh, observing, and you said it better than I did, <laughs> which is not unusual because you are such a great translator of uh, the technical issues into uh, meaningful uh, messaging that, that resonates within organizations. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there that that uh, that that is one very important aspect of the of the issue, focusing on symptoms, not causes. Uh, I think also that the sorts of things that you mentioned are indicative of this tendency to look at things that are familiar and that are easy to measure and that we're used to looking at. So if we've been looking at ride-alongs for 10 years, well, great, you know, we've been looking at ride-alongs for 10 years. I hope we fixed, you know, at least the obvious problems after, you know, uh, year 10. Um, if uh, we're worried about off-label promotion, and that's why we were, you know, deciding initially to look at, uh, at ride-alongs, Maybe it's time to pull back to that bigger issue and to try to figure out where, given that we've now looked at sales uh, ride-alongs for 10 years, where else we should be looking to try and really address whatever off-label risk we have. I couldn't agree with you more. The other piece I really enjoyed hearing you talk about is let's look at the utilization data and then correlate that with Salesforce activity or marketing activities to see if there's a direct correlation to that increase in utilization and activities we had, both positive and negative. There may be good correlations that are appropriate, but that means for me that we need to look at it from a compliance perspective, not necessarily from a marketing and sales perspective to make sure we are right. truly uncovering the problems that may be there. Absolutely. And and to, to add on to your important point there, a lot of times, obviously, data will be used from a sales and marketing perspective. There, there's a lot of resourcing. There's a lot of attention with respect to what that data can tell us. And understandably so. I'm not criticizing that at, at all from, uh, from obviously a sales or marketing perspective. It will be natural, though, that the government will ask the question, hey, if you looked at this important data from a sales and marketing perspective, and you, you found it to be so important from those perspectives, wasn't it also important to look at it from a compliance perspective? And if you didn't, why is that so? Right. That's wonderful. Do we have any other questions? Because I think we've come to our time. And if there's, we have time for one other, if there is one, otherwise, we'll move on. I don't see any in my queue. So, Bill, I have to say thank you. I've enjoyed your uh, presentation and sharing with you what you see from a government perspective on some of the, what the government is looking for, some of the deficiencies and what we need to do going forward. And as always, you got me thinking again and looking at how we look at compliance differently and our monitoring approaches and where we need to go for the future, which will lead us into okay. our next webinar which will get into really what uh, companies are doing today and sort of building for what the deficiencies are and where we need to go down the road. So with that, Bill, I thank you very much. I thank the audience for uh, joining us today. I hope they found some good insights and ways forward. And we'll start simplifying this whole matter as we go through the next couple of webinars. With that, I say goodbye. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. Thank you.